Hey everyone. <laughs> hey everyone. Hello, hello. Old friends and new faces, welcome. And yes, do tell us. Uh, think about the last course you've attended. How was the experience for you? Was it rather woohoo? I love it. It was so amazing. It was, oh boy, it was a bit, uh, you know, it was a struggle to get through it. Let us know how that how that went. Destination is unknown. Right. about the past. I got no time for that. This life is going so fast. Just love smile and laugh. Go out the world. Yes, that's a good sign. Beautiful. Well, I think that uh, it's always good to look also and try to empathize and put ourselves in the shoes of our learners, participants, whenever we design a learning experience. And I don't know about you guys, but I always take inspiration from other people's work, their courses, their workshops, their trainings. So I always like to look at it and be like, oh, where did I experience something that was really, really cool? How can I take that and bring it into my design? So I'm happy that we have attended lots of really cool uh, sessions and trainings and learning experiences. Uh, and Lana, I'm sorry if that felt a bit like, oh boy, what's happening? <laughs> uh, and hopefully today we are here with Alexandra and she's going to teach us a couple of her very you know, tried and tested tips and tricks on how to design beautiful, uh, impactful, memorable, cohort-based courses. Alexandra, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Out of the blue, you know, hi, it's me. Join us. And she was like, sure. Uh, I'll join you guys and I can't wait to, to share my uh, knowledge with you. I'm very, very happy to have you with us today. And I'm pausing my music. Uh, tell us can you maybe wiggle a finger say hi to the camera so we can see you alexandra Woo. oh sorry i, I was Yay. waiting them. can you see me now <laughs> yes absolutely um awesome. alexandra is doing this for a living she is uh working with different experts with small audiences to help them design, create, launch cohort-based courses. And she has worked so far with over 50 experts and top industry players such as Maven, Rite of Passage, and District 3 Innovation. I've been following her on Twitter for a while, and she has lots, lots of tips and tricks to share. I'm going to paste uh, pop also her course and the community and her wonderful newsletter um, in the chat as well. So you can follow her work and all her thoughts there and continue learning. And Alexandra, closing this and i am passing the passing it over to you awesome well away. thank you so much for having me anna maria and for the impressive dj set it definitely <laughs> set the vibe so i love it um so i think we'll just uh we'll just pull up my slide deck for a second um i might get you to help me do that <laughs> okay awesome most cohort-based courses get wrong about learning design. Um, as Anna Maria said, I'm Alexandra Allen. And just to give you a, a quick rundown on my background, I am an online course designer and trainer, like she mentioned. Um, and I've been in this space for a bit over three years now. And I've worked with some pretty uh, impressive industry players, I think. Um, I, I really admire companies like Maven, Rite of Passage, who are really kind of setting the, uh, the bar for what a good cohort-based course is. And I've also worked with um, District 3 Startup Hub, um, which is why I apply a lot of startup principles towards course building. So a lot of iteration, experimenting, um, and that's all really come in handy as part of this, this journey I'm on of helping people create more courses because as much as building a, a course is a lot about learning design, it's also really about building a business with a lot of startup principles, um, as many of you know. So really excited to be here today. I am. Um, I studied learning design and tech at the Harvard Extension School before I forayed into this area. And when I studied there, it was actually my first experience as a student learning in a CBC format, because I'm sure most of you, um, you know, being around the same age, uh, university was in person for me. So when I started uh, studying learning design and tech at the Extension School in 2020, uh, right before the pandemic hit, I was actually living in uh, France at the time studying um, from the, the courses were offered in the US. 
And there were people joining from everywhere from South America to Dubai, India. And what was so powerful about our cohort is that we were able to compare different education systems from different uh, countries, cultures, and just different experience levels. So I really got to see the, the power of a CBC in action as a student. And that's really what kind of put me on this path of wanting to create more of these transformational courses um, and empower people with uh, really unique skill sets to create courses of their own. Uh, so just a couple more points about me. I'm a certified project manager. I think um, if any of you, um, we're going to do a poll in a second, but if any of you have worked on courses, and I'm sure the Butter team can attest to this, uh, doing online learning events is a lot like event planning. Uh, there's a lot of logistics. Um, so project management skills definitely come in handy. Um, and at the moment, I'm working remotely from Montreal, Canada, but I've also lived in London, Sydney, and Paris. So that's another reason I'm really passionate about doing these online sessions is we get to connect people from all around the world in one, uh, one room. <laughs> so uh, my checklist for a great session, I always tell people, if you can have your cameras on, that's great, because I love to see your faces, your reactions. Um, and same thing, if you want to raise your hand, you can um, use the, the butter features or physically raise your hand if you want, and we'll flag you down. Um, but the, the main things are ask questions, um, share comments. We really want this to be engaging and as conversational as possible. Yes, I am presenting, but the whole point of us doing it live versus just a recording is that we want you to feel engaged and empowered to ask questions, you know, uh, challenge anything you disagree with. Or if anyone uh, wants to ask a question in the chat or, you know, uh, vocally, if you have experience that you can speak to that and want to share your own experience, please go ahead and do so, because that's really the value of these sessions is snowballing off of each other's uh, ideas and suggestions. So we're also going to do a couple of breakouts so that even though this is mostly a presentation, uh, you'll be getting, like I said, a lot of um, active learning out of it and you'll get to meet some cool people too in the Butter community. So uh, be as engaged as possible. I see a lot of emojis and stuff coming up, which is awesome. So uh, keep them coming for the session. So we're gonna do a, a quick poll to find out who's in the room. So I just wanna get a sense of where people are at in their course creator journey. So we're gonna um, throw up a poll and just let us know, are you at this stage of, you know, you have an idea, but you're not really sure what you're, you know, you haven't started building it yet, or maybe you're already in the process of building it, um, or maybe you're a, you're a pro and you've already run one. Oh, wow, okay, we've got a lot of people who have run a course before, nice. We've got one holding it down and then not applicable. So awesome. <laughs> Feel free to share your reasons if you're not into course building, what your, you know, your motivation for coming is. That'd be interesting to find out. But okay, a lot of so 25 people who have run a course before. Amazing. So I love that you're all invested in learning how to make it better and just make sure you're not in these three pitfalls that we're going to cover today. Okay. And then 12 thinking of creating a course and um, eight building. Everyone can see the results, I think, right, Anna Maria? Okay, awesome. Yes. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. All right, we will hop back to our slide deck now. Yeah. So Alexandra, if you go to the toolbox, it would be great if you could pop the slides. Otherwise, it will be my face kind of. Oh, okay, perfect. Back on the, yes. Okay, so in the share. Uh, uh, sorry, was... in the key on in the keynote at the top. And the then oh, okay, perfect. There we go. Just give me a thumbs up if it's uh, if it's showing. Yes, it's perfect. All good? Oh, awesome. Okay, right where we left off. Perfect. Um, okay, so here's our agenda. Uh, so we're going to do three things today in the spirit of, like I said, talking about the three common mistakes people make with cohort-based courses. And what's great is we're going to go into what the mistakes are, but then we're going to focus on what you could do instead to make your course really strong. So we're going to start by defining what outcome-driven courses are. Then we're going to hop up, hop into a, a breakout so you can meet some people and kind of talk about it. Next, we're going to look at how do you identify gaps and misunderstandings your students have about your topic. And then again, we're going to do a, a breakout to mix things up. And then finally, we're going to come back and we're going to discuss, you know, what is a hands on workshop versus, uh, you know, something that's basically a glorified webinar. So we're going to look at those three things um, one by one. So first things up, uh, we're going to define outcome driven courses. So another quick poll question, I just wanna know, have you ever been in this situation where either, think about it in the terms of your work, where either you were training, it could be a new employee or just you know someone more junior than you, or they were training you, um, and the situation went like this, where 
everything started off great. It's going well. Everything's, you know, moving along as planned. But then whether it was the last day or the last few hours, all of a sudden you're going, oh my God, we don't have a lot of time. And you start flying through things and it feels super panicked of just getting through things. And you realize, okay, this is not in touch with like how it started. It's just like a race to the end. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. <laughs> so it's a pretty relatable challenge. Okay. Seeing a few no's, that's, that's reassuring that not to, not every training experience is bad. Okay. So 30, 35 people said yes though. So the majority is yes. Um, and I admit I've, I've been there as a trainer and as a student uh, where same thing, it's, you know, it's been great until you get to the point where you think, okay, no, we really got to get through stuff and you start motoring. So that's a really good um, point to move into our first myth about um, courses, the, a mistake that people often make because it's intuitive, but isn't, isn't um, effective learning design. So the myth is this, people say when you're building your curriculum for your course, they say, start with the first thing students should know. And that's really intuitive, right? Because we all think, okay, well, of course, it's the beginning. So what do I tell them first? And then we start doing a brain dump. Okay, okay, well, I should tell them this and then maybe that. But the problem with that is that you are you might be giving them too much information. So the expert point of view here is that you actually want to start with an outcome in mind. So I like to say, think of it as your GPS or um, I think in, the, in Europe, they call it a site nav or something for whatever you plug into your car for directions. Uh, but you put a destination in first, right? You don't say I need directions if you don't know where you're going. So you put in a destination and that's what happens with, um, with, with a, a good course too, is figure out what the outcome is and then work backwards to figure out what's the quickest route based on where students are now. And then that's how you want to build your curriculum is starting from that structure. And I'm going to go through that more in depth, um, but I just want to really break this down because you'll see this everywhere. And it drives me crazy seeing it on LinkedIn, Twitter too, people who don't really know much about course building saying, it's super easy to start with the first thing and then the next thing and the next thing. And it's like, okay, but that's not effective in creating a strong curriculum. So here's, um, here's what I want to go through. So I'm going to share a specific example, but before I do that, I just want to introduce you to this concept called backwards design. And so backward design is an outcome driven learning framework. And it was introduced in 1998 in the book, understanding by design by uh, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTee. And it's become widely adopted uh, specifically in North America in schools and stuff, because what was happening is a lot of teachers were just applying this thing of, okay, if I want to teach someone about this topic, what should I tell them? And then they were just kind of making a list. And to give you an example, when I studied learning design and tech at the Harvard extension school, my professor, um, who's a Harvard educated professor, she was saying that um, one of the evaluations she did of a school was uh, teachers wanted to teach, let's say like uh, grade one students about apples. So they thought, okay, well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna like spend the semester learning about apples. And they said, okay, well, we're gonna do like art projects where they cut out apples. We're gonna take them to an apple orchard. We're gonna talk about like apple picking, all these different things. But what they noticed is, okay, it was great that everything was relevant to apples, but they were just like fragmented activities that weren't really giving the students anything they could really do as a whole. They weren't developing this huge education on apples. It was more just like random facts. So what they proposed to them was think about, okay, what do you want them to be able to do with the information you're giving and then work backwards to create an experience of, okay, maybe the project centers around thinking like, what do apples look like? You know, what are, what are they, uh, how do they grow? And then in the end, it culminates in them going to an apple orchard and seeing in person, you know, how they can actually pick them and that sort of thing. So it's this idea of start with what you want, what uh, students should know and be able to do by the end of your time together and then work backwards to figure out what makes a, a viable path to that end. Does that make sense to people? Thumbs up or? <laughs> awesome, okay. So we're gonna go through an example now. So let's say uh, we're gonna keep it really simple here before we go into like what it would look like in an actual course. But let's say I wanted to use backward design to make a cup of tea. Uh, it would be really simple. Okay. So let's say I know my final, like, imagine this is my, my teacup here. I'm, I'm about to drink my tea. So I think to myself, okay, what is the last step before I drink my tea? And I know in my case, it's adding milk, but for some people it might be adding sugar. So my last step in the sequence is add milk or sugar. So I know that's the last step. Then if I work backwards, I know the step before that is okay. Well, before I can add the milk or sugar, I have to steep my tea for a good two minutes. And then in order to steep my tea, I know that the step before that is to pour the hot water into the mug. And then I won't go through them one by one, but I'll just fill in the, the, the first three. It's 
Before that, you'd have to put the tea bag in the mug. And then before that, you'd have to boil the water. And again, step one is you'd have to pick a mug. So you can see how, again, this seems so simple and so basic, but the difference is if you started from the beginning without thinking about the outcome and someone just said, okay, well, teach me, teach me about tea. Like if someone wanted to know how to make a cup of tea and you didn't ask them, well, okay, what do you want to be able to do? You might start thinking, okay, well, I'll start talking about different types of tea, you know, tisanes versus caffeinated tea. You could boil the water with a pot. You could boil it with a kettle. So all of a sudden you're, you're putting all this information and you could be overloading someone with information when the person says, stop, like, I just want to make a cup of tea. Like, don't, don't teach me everything there is to know about tea. So the idea here is that you start with, okay, what are these core pillars? Like these six things are now the pillars of your curriculum. And if you decide based on the group you're working with, where they actually have a, a huge interest in tea and they want to know what's the difference between a tisane and a caffeinated tea, then for step three, I don't know if you can see my mouth circling, but um, for step three, maybe at that point in the course, you go into a bit of depth as part of this activity of, okay, well, when you, when you decide on which um, tea bag, you can talk about the different kinds and give them options to think through. And likewise for step two, when it comes to boiling the water, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, but you never know. You could tell people, look, you can use a, a pot on the stove. You could use a, you know, an automatic kettle that you plug in. But the point is, you know, everything is centered around an action. So if you're adding more context and more information, all of it is in service of one of the pillars in taking that uh, step towards an outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm I'm, I'm not seeing tons of the chat, but um, are there any comments? Feel free to call them out if there's anything you want to interrupt with. All good. Okay. Um, so let's look at how this applies now to building a curriculum for let's say a project management course. So this is based on someone I actually built a course with. So what happened when I first met um, this course creator is she told me, okay, I want to build a course on project management. She kind of described the, the persona loosely of who she was building for. So she was saying that based on this information, this, this bad information of starting with the first thing uh, students should know, she's like, okay, well, I think I want to cover smart goals, probably want to cover some project management softwares. Another friend said I should talk about uh, project planning frameworks. I also think I should talk about the characteristics of a good project manager. And then she's like, and I have a bunch of other things. And it was just like this huge list. So my advice was, okay, stop for a second. Instead of just doing like a chaotic brain dump of everything you've ever learned about project management, you have to remember that if it's taken you, you know, 10 years or like three years or something to learn something, and you're teaching a course for like two or three weeks, there's no way you can convey that much information. So you really have to be intentional, intentional about what you're actually helping them achieve in your time together, right? You have to be realistic. Um, and a lot of that comes down to just knowing your persona as well. So what I su suggest that we do is, okay, instead of doing that, let's talk about how would we approach this if we were using backward design? So then just based on a quick conversation of um, understanding who she was working with, she, she ruled out that, okay, she doesn't need to get into softwares and stuff like that. She wanted to, um, she wanted to have it super basic that people are going to submit a project plan in Excel. Like that was the end goal is to just teach them really about the frameworks and stuff. And the tool was just a side part in that equation. So we identified in reverse chronological, uh, chronological order. You can see here, I don't know if you can see me highlighting it, but um, submit their project plan in Excel was the final step. So if we work backwards, we realize, okay, well, in order for them to do that, they need to build their project plan in Excel. So that'll have to be one of the, you know, if you think of the T thing, the line, that has to be the step before that. And then in order for them to actually build a project plan where they're identifying specific tasks and stuff, they actually have to know how to create a project timeline first. So a high level overview of how, what's everything going to sit under. And before they can do that, they actually need to create their smart goals because that's going to inform the timeline and the milestones. Um, and again, before they do that, they have to decide on a project. So we identified that these were the five, the five pillars, same with the T of what you need to do. And then everything else in terms of content fits around those. So in the case of project management software, for example, we realized, okay, while this is not part of the core of your course, what would be cool is to record a loom video and have links and stuff as like bonus material of, okay, if you want to take it further, these are some softwares I recommend here are links to free demos, that sort of thing. But it's, you can see the difference of if she had just added this in her course, specifically for people who don't necessarily need it, it becomes noise. It's not part of that minimum viable path of getting you towards an outcome. And then it may course less of a, you know, outcome oriented experience and more of just like a, a ton of information that people can't necessarily process. Um, so the takeaway here is that again, most course creators focus too much on information transfer and a big part of this, um, I'm just adding this as a caveat is, it becomes like a, a, 
a point of like insecurity of when we bring people together in these spaces as the teacher, we're really trying to create space for them to apply what we're telling them. So a lot of it comes down to us organizing it so well that they can spend most of their time doing the exercises and getting feedback. But a lot of people think as the instructor, people are coming here to hear you talk and they feel insecure if they're not talking all the time. So they end up putting too much information, but people want less information and more action. So that's the real value here. And in order to promote the skill development, you want students to apply what they're, do, what they're learning to, their, to real problems of their own. So this is where backwards design is a game changer um, in terms of making it an outcome driven course. Any questions on that? All good? Okay. So we're gonna do a quick breakout now. So uh, you've heard me talking a lot, so you'll get to uh, meet some other cool people. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 10 minutes and in groups of three, just share your name and location where you're tuning in from. What brings you to the session today? I know we kind of touched on it lightly, but just share with the group uh, what brought you. And think about, if you're not doing a course, don't worry about it. But if you are thinking of doing a course, just go with your gut feeling. It doesn't have to be you know, the correct answer, but how could you potentially use backward design to teach your topic? So think about what could be a potential outcome and you don't, you're not committing to this. It's just an idea to get you in this mindset of start thinking about outcomes. What could be a potential outcome for your course based on your topic? So we'll get again, um, name and location, what brought you here and how you could use backwards design for your topic. So share an order of uh, longest to shortest first name and just make it a conversation, uh, get to know the people in your room and then we'll uh, continue on when you get back. All right, we'll see everyone in 10 minutes. Yeah. Any questions before we go into breakout? Nope. All right, have fun. Waiting on a train, waiting in the station. One way to get. Got no control or regrets. Right, right now, I think we're back. All right, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, you had some good conversations with some cool people. See some she smiling faces, up. so that's a good sign. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, welcome back, everyone. I see some emojis popping up, so it looked like people uh, had some great combo. So, again, super thrilled. Um, a big part of us being here is that you get to connect with other people too, and you don't just have to hear me talk. <laughs> um, okay, so jumping into part two now, we're going to jump into how you can identify knowledge gaps and misunderstandings in your students so that you can bridge those gaps and give them a strong foundation to start your course. So quick poll again, I wanna know, have you ever been in this situation where, again, maybe you were the one explaining something or someone was explaining it to you, but all of a sudden someone's like, whoa, 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 I like, I don't know what you're talking about or we're not on the same page. Like we need to go back to the beginning and start from the beginning. Cause like, I'm not following at all what you're saying. Um, so really having to go to the source of like, okay, we're totally on a different page. Okay. I see a good 19 or so. Yes. I've had those misunderstandings. Three of you. Nope. Never been in that situation. I envy you. <laughs> you must have some very clear communicators in your life. So that's really good. Okay. But an overwhelming amount say yes. So 30 people. Um, Anita says, every time I talk to a data scientist in my team, yes, talking to people with different specialties, it's prone to happen because again, jargon, there's so many factors, but the point is most of us have is experienced this situation where you're like, okay, we're, we're really not getting each other. We need to like circle back and start from the beginning to get clear. So that's a really great note now to jump to our next slide, which is really talking about course foundation. So. I always love using this example to talk to people about like how important the foundation of your course is because I tell them, imagine teaching algebra to someone who thinks two plus two is five. That's a nightmare, right? Because you're gonna give them all these equations and it, no matter how good a job you do at explaining um, all, all sorts of complicated um, <laughs> algebraic express, um, equations, they're not gonna be understanding you and they're always gonna be getting the wrong answer because they think two plus two is five and that dooms everything that comes after that. So this is why I tell people you need to think of the same thing. And I really liked Anita's example too of, you know, speaking to a data scientist, if you're not a data scientist or anyone else, anyone else in a specialty different from yours, if you, if you don't get the basics, get clear on the basics together, then anything you build on top of that is doomed to tip over, right? Because you're building on a rocky foundation that doesn't make sense. So the way you want to help students 
create a strong foundation is that you want to do two things. First, you want to bust uh, misunderstandings. And these can be like common myths about your industry or your topic. And then second, you want to bridge knowledge gaps. So these can be a variety of things of, for example, um, for courses where you're teaching people how to write, one of the biggest misconceptions, myths that goes around about writing is that you're either born uh, to be like an author or you're doomed to be a terrible writer. But anyone who writes regularly, and I consider myself someone who writes as well, um, knows that with practice, you'll get better. And you know, the more you read good writing, the more you'll internalize it, but it's just all practice and learning. Um, and same thing with whether it's athletics or anything else, like the best athletes in the world will tell you it comes through practice. So misunderstandings and myths could be everything from generally thinking um, basic principles are wrong, like two plus two equals five, or it could be things like imposter syndrome or just thinking like identity wise that you're not able to do something because you don't fit like the, the most common persona. So this is where you really need to empower your students to get a strong foundation, because when you don't, what happens is you might create a phenomenal course on your topic. But if somebody comes in with a limiting belief or if they think that they don't need to practice a lot or something, they won't realize the results that you've set them up to achieve. And then they're going to blame you and say, like, no, your course was terrible and I didn't get the results. And it's like, well, no, if you had been, had a strong foundation and come into this with the right mindset, then you would have excelled in my course. So in order to make it win win, you need to start your course by actually addressing um, myths, misunderstandings and bridging any gaps people have in their knowledge. So this is how you do that. Um, and this is inspired, like I said, when I studied at the Harvard Extension School, my professor took her, um, her outline for how she did this, was inspired by, again, this book, Understanding by Design by Wiggins um, and McTee. And it was really helpful of we would think about it in two, in two ways. So you think of it as, first of all, you can see the first list students might think, and it has the big red X of, this is where you wanna list everything that comes to mind that students might think that's incorrect. So like I said, for a writing course that you're either a good writer or you're not um, that um, you know it's going to happen overnight like anything that doesn't make sense and then you want to kind of flip it into a more positive version so similar to what i did at the start i don't know if you remember that slide i can always click back to it but i talked about one of the myths about course design being that you should start with the first thing students should know and then i said no actually what people don't realize is the expert point of view is that you should start with the outcome and work backwards from there so in the same way you want to think about your course you want to flag everything that's a myth as like an X, and then you want to convert it into something positive of what students might not realize is that this is the expert point of view that, okay, no, you're, you're not automatically a good writer. You have to, pra anyone who practices could become one. So a lot of these will come to you naturally as you think through them. And to my point, think about things that like frustrate you that you see either on like Twitter or LinkedIn that people believe about your field. Um, it could be stuff that you notice like novices who are in your field making mistakes that you used to make. But all of those things, they'll come to you pretty naturally. But if they don't, here's what helps I find identify them. So if you're stuck on them, and usually when I do that exercise, set a timer for like 10 minutes and just do like a brain dump of like, okay, what are all the problems you see? And if you're stuck, think about, um, you know, what is the misleading advice I said? Uh, like I said, advice you see shared versus like mistakes that novices make. So the better we get in our fields, right? We look back, we see mistakes and I think, oh, I used to do that. So I've grown, thank God. Um, but you realize that other people need your help and someone probably pointed out to you that you were making that mistake. So how do you incorporate that into your course? And then I, I always laugh at this one, like other nonsense circulating because in all of our fields, there's always some stuff that's going around that you think like that's really bad advice. Um, yes, learning styles, that's a great one, Benoit. Um, that's outdated and a lot of people still quote it. So stuff like that. Um, and I just put jokingly with the monkey emojis, like anything that makes you kind of like cringe or think, oh God, like those are things you want to address. Even if they seem obvious to you, they're not obvious to people who are not experts and you have to really be um, make a point of saying it. And this is why I like the exercise of if I just hop back to the other page of um, listing through, you could just say in your course, look, anyone who practices writing could be a good writer, but what's more powerful if you say to them, look, this is a common myth. A lot of people believe that you have to be good at writer. It's not true. This is what we think. And, you know, explain and really walk them through it. It really helps them kind of like, this is why I love, they call it busting like myths and misunderstandings. Like you're busting it up and like taking it out of their life, out of a, like out of their way so that it's no longer a barrier and they can move forward. So really helpful to think of that. Um, and the takeaway here, as you can see my little construction emoji is that you just want to safeguard your students from getting cracks in their foundation because otherwise, like I said, they're building on lopsided ground and you know, it's nothing's going to stick with them. Everything's going to be lopsided. 
And to my point earlier, you know, the poll we talked about, you're both going to end up frustrated because you're going to feel like you're both like, why aren't you getting it? And they're going to be like, why aren't you understanding that it's not working for me? And it's all because it all circles back to they don't have a strong foundation. And there's a tree analogy I, I always uh, love using. It it's goes, um, the deeper the roots, the stronger the branches. So meaning when you set really strong roots with your learning, people can flourish into these really strong trees and branches and grow and grow. But it all comes down to having those strong roots. So you really want to think about not enough people think about the mindset of their course. They're just like, cool, let's hit the ground running and go. But a big part of your course is really getting people out of their head and breaking like those self-limiting beliefs. So that's a really um, important part at the start of your course is to address that. Um, okay, so we're gonna skip the, the second breakout because we're a little behind schedule. And anyway, it seems like it went pretty fast anyway. <laughs> um, but um, we're gonna go straight to the third point. So talking about um, hands-on workshops. So another poll question, I wanna know if you've ever been in this situation where you sign up for a workshop and then you get there and it turns out to be just a glorified webinar where it's just the person talking, people don't even have their cameras on, there's no breakout rooms, Any anything like that that's kind of disappointing of it's not as active as you anticipated it would be. Okay, the results are rolling in and okay, nice. We've got one person who's never been shafted, nice. <laughs> um, we've got our two. 29 people say yes. Okay. And I've definitely been to many as well, where it's been promoted as a workshop and then it's, um, it's not, uh, it hasn't panned out that way. Okay. So 32 people said yes, two said no. So that's really good. So just continuing on, I call them like glorified work, uh, glorified webinars when people say it's like a workshop, but it's really just someone talking the whole time and everyone else is off camera. It's not like butter. <laughs> um, so having a platform like this definitely helps. I will say that you can't, cause you can feel more engaged. Um, but the big myth here is that, again, you'll remember I said earlier, um, hopefully, that a lot of people have almost like an insecurity when they're teaching their course where they think, well, people are coming to my course, so I need to be sharing tons of information and giving a lot of content. So this creates a myth that you should be presenting for most of the session. Um, but really, the expert point of view is that, again, it's all about holding space. And if you have a lot of content and stuff you want to share, you could always record Loom videos and stuff to share beforehand. But when people come to a workshop, if you're calling it a workshop, they're expecting to practice something, to go through an exercise, to get feedback, meet their peers. Because students really learn through experience and reflection. So this is where peer feedback helps because then they can decide, how do I feel about that? How do I want to integrate it? So again, it comes back to this idea of it's a myth that, okay, you're on the stage and you're, per you're presenting in a workshop. It's really about creating space. And something I always say to people is when you create, the, uh, your, when you create workshops, you almost like have to feel insecure about feeling like I'm really not doing a lot. Like I'm really just running the exercises. So I don't feel like I'm talking that much. And I always say to people I work with, if you don't feel like insecure, like you're not doing enough, it means you've done the right thing because most of the design and stuff takes place before the workshop. That's the heavy lifting. And then running it is creating space for people to do the exercises that you've carefully designed beforehand. So it's an illusion. Um, and it's funny because even like working on uh, courses like Rite of Passage, I remember a friend of mine who meant we mentored together um, it was his first time doing a workshop and he's like, whoa, I completely overestimated how much I should put into a workshop. He's like, I need like one tenth of what I thought I was going to do. And I'm like, yeah, because the value is not you giving them 10, 10 concepts to think about. It's you giving them one to really dig into, get feedback on and feel really confident leaving that they can continue applying it to actually master it. So a uh, really important note there. And then in terms of applying backwards design, um, I talked about applying it to your curriculum overall. And the thing is, you also want to apply it to your workshops because your workshops are essentially units of a course. And like I said, when we applied backward um, design, we got like the pillars of the course of like what they are in terms of the activities they're going to do. And then maybe each one of those becomes its own workshop, for example. But then once you get into the workshop, you actually have to design it. And you, this is where you want to use backward design again to make sure that the way, the same way your course is outcome driven, you want each workshop to be outcome driven to this specific like sub outcome, if you will. So here's again, going back to this example of the, um, the project management course, one of the uh, workshops the course creator wanted to do was she wanted to have it on smart goal setting. We identified that was one of the things, remember? So we, we worked backwards and starting from the top, you can see the last step was okay, well, if by the end of the workshop, and again, it could be 60, 90 minutes, two hours, whatever you choose, if by the end of that session, you want your students to finalize their SMART goals, then we know that working backwards, in order for them to finalize their goals, they need to get feedback. So we know getting peer feedback is the second to last step. 
And then before they can get feedback, they obviously need to draft their goal. So that would be the first thing. But what you can do here is you can mix and match in the sense of, we know that's the order now to be outcome driven, but let's say the course creator decided that she wanted to break up SMART goals. It's an acronym for five different types of goals. So she could do them all in one go and then just have it, okay, draft, feedback, finalize. That could be one way of doing it. Or she might decide, okay, well, I wanna do the S and M, the um, specific and measurable ones first. And then I want to have them draft them, get feedback, finalize them, and then repeat that sequence again for the ART ones of, okay, then we're gonna draft the last three, get peer feedback and do it again. So you see, you can mix and match, but the thing that stays the same is you understand that it's still all working in service of this outcome because you've worked backwards to figure out what you need to do. And then depending on what else you wanna add, um, it can factor into that, but you know what the key actions are. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, cool. See some thumbs and some nodding. <laughs> so the takeaway here is, like I said, workshops are really units of a course. So you wanna think of them as almost like mini courses within the course. And so you still wanna use backwards design to make sure, again, you're being outcome driven as you would be in your curriculum. Because a lot of people make this mistake of being outcome driven with their curriculum. But then when it comes to the workshops, they revert back to, okay, what's the first thing I should tell them about this? And it's like, no, you always start from the back um, and use backwards design. Um, so that's just a recap of what we've done today. I'm just looking at the time. Okay, we've, got, we've still got time for Q&A. Um, so we, we looked at how do you define outcome-driven courses using backwards design. We talked about how to identify knowledge gaps and misunderstandings like myths using the students might think or students might not realize prompts. And then we talked about hands-on workshops using the 80-20 rule, so keep that in mind. And of course, we met some cool people, which is probably the highlight in sharing um, by sharing our ideas. So that's just a recap of, of what we've done. And I wanna know now if there's one thing you took from today on something you would do differently based on how you were doing things already or planning to do things, uh, what would that one thing be? So you can either let us know in the chat or Anna Maria, if people wanna unmute and chat, that would be great too. Totally open to either one. The chat's firing up. Content, 80-20. Less, talk less in workshops, the meets, less lectures, more workshops. You're awesome, by the way, Alexandra, <laughs> Kevin says. <laughs> All right, begin with the end in mind. Find and and ask for advice from the experts. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> and you have a fan. <laughs> oh, nice. A little less conversation. Okay, I like it. <laughs> we oh, yeah, also have a couple of uh, a couple of questions that I've pinned and can surface them uh, if that's okay, Alexandra. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. Perfect. Right. So here we are. So Heidi asked. Is quickest always the best way or are there situations where you've seen a slower learning mechanic in the course providing a better result? And Heidi, if you want to add to this question a bit of context, feel free to do so um, on mute and share. Nice. Um, well, I can, I can hop in to start um, unless you want to jump in, Heidi, feel free. So I would say definitely say no. Quicker isn't always... Um, Quicker can be an illusion for sure. And this is why I love backwards design so much because one thing you'll notice is when you apply it is most of the time we overestimate how much we can pack into a course. So we think like, okay, again, it's this curse, of, like the curse of knowledge or experts curse, right? Where they say, mm -hmm. you forget how much people don't know, like you underestimate how much you know. And so you think you're gonna take like everything you've learned in the last 10 years and turn it into one course, not realizing like people can't digest that much in one go. So typically each, each of us could create multiple courses or like a suite of courses, you know? Um, so I think backwards design is a really great way to think of us. And this is where you have to trust your intuition as a, a teacher and as an expert in your field. Like for example, um, you know, I, I've taken part in like, a, you know, a writing course that's like five weeks, for example. And like that was ample time to get good at writing like a weekly essay. If it had been two weeks, I don't think I would have gotten as, you know, as far in the course because I'm like, well, that's a lot to master in just two weeks. So I think this is where you really need to trust yourself with backwards design of, okay, if I'm looking at my pillars, like, is this reasonable that I could do this much in this time? Mm. And this that's yeah. especially around like, um, I would say like behavior change too. Like I know someone um, who, I, who I worked with once was creating a course on like nutrition and they were saying, you know, you're not gonna master nutrition or like eating differently in 
a week or two. So she was like, I'm going to do it for at least 30 days because there's a real behavior change that goes into that. Yeah. And also if I, Heidi, I don't know if you were in the previous session with Lauren where, where she touched a bit on how, how we actually learn and what happens in the brain and the importance of not cramming information and space repetition and interleaving and so on across a, a period of time. That was also, that's another extra argument why quickest is not always the be the best way to go uh, or rarely the best way to go anything you want to add here any any addition to that Heidi if you're if you're still with us all right so next question from Riri um if you need to design a course for 1000 plus employees with different needs and different expectations how can you gather those knowledge or skill gaps and make sure you address them in the course also knowing that you might not be able to answer each and every single individual need. Wow. Okay. That, that's a big mm -hmm. ask. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess my, my follow-up question there would be um, like, what specifically is it around? Like if it's something kind of like, uh, you know, like IT updates or that sort of thing where it's kind of very process-based, I think generally what I've seen work is people identify at least like some key personas to break it down. Cause a thousand people is so extreme, right? So mm -hmm. if it's, mm -hmm. um, depending on often what what would help is like a a competency um what do we call it um different people call it different things framework, but matrix. yeah competency framework or um like a skills matrix of again in the mm. spirit of being like outcome driven having like a skills matrix of even if it's like cross-referenced of like um you know where do people fit on this rubric of okay are they really technical versus are they you know uh something else like if, it, if it's on like presenting skills or giving feedback having some mm -hmm. sort of like matrix could then help create like different variations of the same thing. Or it could be, again, what you'd have to focus on if, if your task was literally create one course that has to suit everyone. My advice would be um, one of the best ones I've seen that was uh, like a, um, I think it was on some sort of, some sort of uh, like tech oriented training for employees. But what was cool is it again, using like backwards design had all the minimum viable things you needed to do, but it would tell you like, if you're trying to create um, like a, a something on a website, like, I don't know, like a header or something, it would tell you like, okay, hey, this is the basic way to do it. This is like mm -hmm. the intermediate. If you want to like add special fonts, make it like your own branding. And then there was one, they called it like as a joke, like full geek mode, where it would actually show you how to like create code to go like really specific. So I think as long as you identify those, those areas of, okay, these, this is what you need to do, but Hey, if you want to take it one step further, here's like another optional module. Here's another one. And I know even for myself, when I've had to go through those sort of, um, trainings, certain ones, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to read the extra versus others that are like, do your own code. I'm like, hell no. I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to skip that one and leave that for people who are proficient in that area. Hmm. Great tips. Thank you. I'm moving on because I'm hoping we could actually, we can actually, actually answer all of them. Do you recommend making module one, the first live session, all about busting those meets we were talking about or just videos, Kevin, and if you want to add there and make sure sorry it went quiet Thank for a you. second all about what do you do you recommend making the first module or the first live session all about the meat bust busting meats uh that, that we were talking or that the learners meets the people oh. misconception that people might bring into the course or is it videos okay like when do we bring that in is that an activity is that a course is that a video how how how, how do we do that yeah, great question. Again, I think it's intuitive of knowing your audience and like what they'll appreciate. I, I think it's nice to do it an exercise in the first session because again, like I said, a big part of a big part of what holds people back from trying to do these things on their own too is also just like the a confidence thing and like needing help and feeling mm -hmm. overwhelmed. So for me, it's really powerful to do an exercise like that. And one thing I find cool is like I, I always have like pens and notebooks and stuff, physical ones with me. And what was really cool is I worked with a psychologist who was creating a course. And he was explaining to me the science of our minds and like hand when we're writing being more connected versus just typing. So I think when you're doing getting people to like open up about their insecurities and stuff, sometimes it's actually nice to tell them like, hey, bring a notebook and we're going to do like a journaling exercise. No one's going to see it, but like open up and give them a prompt about their fears, what's been holding them back and like why they're going to overcome it and how. So I think incorporating that into the first session, it doesn't have to be the whole first session. If anything, I think it's nice to like go through that in the first session at the start, but then take them into an activity right away. So it's like, they're already like busting through it mm. with activity. But again, it can, it can depend on the, on the course. Like if your course is on like overcoming imposter syndrome, maybe it's a number of just like exercises like that. So it could vary. 
All right, thanks. And then Sana uh, is bringing in the heat. Uh, question on hybrid workshops. Uh, imagine having eight people together in a room and then two people are joining online. I think that's a that's a new reality for a lot of companies, a lot of courses, etc. Any tips on how to design activities that engage both groups? Do you have any experience with that, Alexandra? Some wisdom you can share. Um, so typically, I just go just online now. So um, mm. no, not specifically. I mean, I think you can you can adapt for it. Of like even um, working at the startup hub, like some of our teammates at one point were overseas, and we were allowed to then. It was like post COVID when we were back in the office. Um, it, it's not as great an experience, I think, for like some people to be online and others. So like I tend to be all or nothing, but um, mm. it's definitely something to think about. <laughs> right. Okay. And. We have one last minute, James, you have here a really it's an interesting question. <laughs> I'm going to just pop, pop it out there. Our head of education insists on dividing people into groups at the beginning of workshops and come up with what do you want to learn today? The idea is great, but we also already have a structure in place. <laughs> so it sounds like we're hoping for them to say the stuff that we already have designed or prepared, which is awful. Um, any thoughts on that? Okay, sorry, I'm just rereading it to make sure I got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Please no, insist on the ready. I may have misspelled something in there <laughs> as well. So I, I don't That's know okay. if I, I could explain a little better, but it, it, it was just, uh, yeah, we have this workshop, this, this task to gather the, the needs of the workshop, but what we've got is we've got a structured workshop already. So if okay. people say, oh, I'd like to learn this, we go, people stand there awkwardly and go, uh, well, uh, that's not the topic of today and it feels very unprofessional and uh, alienating for them um, okay got so you thoughts of something like kind of group task things that you think would work in that kind of scenario um, or, or yeah I, I've definitely been in that situation too because uh, I worked in corporate training before going independent as well so I agree it's like false advertising and same thing it makes me cringe because you're like we already have it and even when I've done help certain people with courses they kind of like insist on wanting to find out like what people want to learn today. And some people are really flexible where they're literally planning to like adapt based on what people want, which is amazing. But to your point, if the structure is there and it's not going to change, um, that does sound like false advertising. So I think what you could do is bring up like the objectives and stuff you have for the session and maybe ask them, which one are they most excited about diving into or like focusing on or which one's right. most aligned with them. But in the spirit of like this backwards design of always being outcome driven, I think you want to make it clear there too, because otherwise they're going to be like, "Hey, well, this is like false advertising." <laughs> and yeah. Just like why? Well, and what you could do then to add on is at the end of the session, ask them, "What would you like to learn about in future sessions?" So that like you're then kind of planting the seeds for future ones that haven't been structured yet. But I agree, yeah, that that's kind of setting you up for an awkward situation. Yeah, yeah. You you mentioned the the smoothing out the foundations or something. I I prefer group tasks that kind of do that based on the workshop content so um but i like the idea of talking afterwards and, and kind of yeah and, and you're just aligning it to yeah what are they most excited about in the context of what you have because like i've seen that question go awry to where someone's asked that and then someone suggested something that's so completely off topic at the back of my head i'm thinking okay well that's a bit awkward because i mean th that has nothing to do with like what we're planning to do today so it just uh it, i feel like it splits focus when we uh yeah Sorry, Anna Maria. That's Thank the, you. That, Thank that, you. That's for the parking lot, friend. That's a great yeah, topic, but we're just true. going to park it right here on this flip chart, all right? Uh, <laughs> Alexandra, thank you so much for all the great tips and everyone for joining and the awesome questions. Your one word key takeaway, distill everything and pack it into one word, drop it on the poll. Which one would be? What, what are you taking away after today's session? All right. <laughs> I love it how people are packing whole sentences in the in the world. <laughs> That's a great hack. Action, outcome, uh, myth busting, less content, outcome driven learning. <laughs> Backward design, I see came in the uh, in the chat. Beautiful MVP. Lovely. 
Thanks, everyone. It was great having you with uh, Alexandra. An absolute pleasure. Um, I already dropped your links uh, in the chat. Also, let me pop a couple of links. We do have two sessions coming up next uh, next week on Tuesday, the last learning labs. Um, and I'm popping that information in the chat for everyone here. And I'll also enable the soundboard for everyone so we can all cheer and thank Alexandra for the awesome content and tips and tricks that she delivered for us today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> 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 thank you thank you everyone for coming really appreciate it feel free to shoot me more questions on whether it's linkedin twitter etc